Hi everyone! Today we will finally learn about Docker, and we will do it by making a useful machine learning project, specifically a translation program that we can easily share with the world. Now we will build it step by step, solving actual, real-world problems using Docker only. We are not cloning anything from GitHub, and we will of course talk about images, containers, Docker files, Compose files, and we will even see how to publish our own software on Docker Hub. So what exactly are we waiting for? Let's roll! So first of all, what exactly is Docker? Docker is a platform that helps us build, run, and share software. It uses something called containers to create isolated environments where programs live. And even though they use the same hardware as our system, the same processor, memory, and all other components, containers are separated entities that operate in a sandbox. Nothing goes in and nothing goes out, which means that all the modules and libraries that our software needs are already pre-installed inside the container. So we can think of containers as the perfect set of conditions for our software, but why is it so important? Well, let's say we are working on a team project. Batman has a Mac machine, I have a Linux one, and Gandalf is using Windows. Our project may have the exact same code, but it will probably manifest differently on every system. Or alternatively, even if we all have the same operating system, it doesn't mean that our environment is the same. I have the newest version of NumPy, but it fails on Batman's computer because it has conflicts with some other software. It happens all the time, but why do we need this headache if we can just create a controlled, consistent environment that all of us can use? And that's exactly where Docker comes handy. We can all work on three different computers, but if we use the same container, we are actually using the same environment. You will see what I mean shortly, so let's quickly install Docker and I'll continue explaining it as we go. First, we will navigate to docker.com, we will select products and we will go for the personal version. To download it, we will need to sign up, but since I already have an account, I'm just gonna sign in. Now, once Docker Desktop is installed, we will accept the terms and conditions. In my case, I'm gonna skip this lovely form and we will verify that the Docker engine is running given this green bar at the bottom left corner. If that's the case, we can now close the GUI and we can use our terminal instead. In my case, I'll be using the command prompt and I will run it as administrator. And for the record, this tutorial is using Docker version 24.0.6. Great, so how exactly does it work? Well, before we go any further, we will need to understand the concept of Docker images. Docker images are very similar to GitHub repositories, but instead of just storing code, they also store the ideal set of conditions for our code. So we are not just getting a piece of software, but we are getting the environment where our software is already installed. Now, images have a read-only format, which means that we cannot modify them. We can build new images, but we cannot change existing ones. So we can think of them as this static set of instructions, but what are these instructions for? Well, images are instructions for containers. So for example, if images are blueprints for a house, then the container is the house itself. And in technical terms, a Docker container is a running instance of an image. We are not just reading containers, but we are also interacting with them. And yes, you can modify containers as much as you'd like. So in summary, we use images to create containers. And inside them, we are not just running programs, but we are running entire environments. So let's see it in action. So let's search for an image of a nice machine learning library with Docker search TensorFlow. And even though there's quite a few options here, we will go for the Jupyter TensorFlow notebook. So let's quickly copy this name with a right mouse click, and we will then download this image with Docker pool, followed by the name of the image. Where Jupyter is the name of the community that maintains the image, TensorFlow Notebook is the name of the image itself, and a combination of the two is the name of the repository. But what kind of repository are we talking about? Where exactly are we pulling this image from? So let's quickly run this command, and let's navigate 
to hub.docker.com as in docker hub and we will then click on explore which will open a giant collection of images so if we search for jupyter tensorflow we will find the exact same repository we just pulled including the pull command right over here so you can either search here or in the terminal it's entirely up to you now once we finish pulling our image we will turn it into a container with docker run followed by the name of the repository and great, we will copy one of those URLs that Jupyter provides us. We will paste it in our browser and we get a nasty, nasty error. But why? Well, if we go back to our terminal, we see that we are not communicating with our own operating system. My name is not Jovian and I am not using Linux. These are the properties of our container, which is essentially an isolated process on our computer. And because it is isolated, we get an error when we try to access it from the outside. So how are we supposed to solve it? Well, first of all, let's collapse our notebook with Ctrl C. Then we will press the up key to fetch the most recent terminal command. And then right in front of our repository name, we will add the flag of dash P as in ports. Then we will choose a port from our host system. In my case, I'll go for port 8000, followed by a colon, and then the port from our container, which is 8888. And here, we don't really get to choose. We need to specify the exact same port that we got from Jupyter. Great. Now let's give this command a quick run. Let's navigate to our browser. We'll type localhost at port 8000. And beautiful, here's our notebook. Now the last thing left to do is to copy our token from Jupyter. We will paste it as our password and boom, we are in. So we basically created this corridor where Docker takes all the actions that we perform in this lovely browser window and it automatically applies them on our container. In technical terms, we call this process exposing a port. Great, now let's quickly create a new notebook and let's make sure that TensorFlow works. To test it, we will load a very nice dataset with from tensorflow.keras.datasets. We will import MNIST, which is an image dataset of black and white digits. To get those images, we will call the mnist.load underscore data method and we will assign it to data. But the thing is, our data is broken into train and test data, and each of these is broken into samples and labels data. So essentially, our data is a nested tuple with this type of structure. And it's okay if you're not sure what it means, it is not important for this tutorial. Now let's quickly run this cell. And once our data is loaded, despite all those warnings, we will go ahead and plot one of our images with plt.im show as an image show to which we will pass our very first training image with x underscore train in the index of zero and yeah we might as well import the library first before we use it with import matplotlib.pyplot as plt now let's give it a quick run let's have a look at our sample and okay, it looks a lot like five. Now let's quickly verify it by printing the matching label to our sample with Y train in the index of zero. And beautiful, it is five indeed and TensorFlow officially works. But what if we don't have the time to learn TensorFlow and all the machine learning concepts behind it? Can't we just skip the understanding part and go straight for the results? Of course we can. We'll just use a library called Transformers that offers a very large collection of tools for beginners. So let's quickly import it with from Transformers import pipeline. And look at that. Transformers is not installed inside this container. Now, usually we'll just install it with exclamation mark pip install Transformers. But the whole idea of containers is that we never need to install anything. And if something is missing from our image, we cannot just add it. We will need to build a brand new image instead. Now, luckily, we don't need to do it from scratch. We can use the TensorFlow notebook as a base and we can combine it with some new modules. 
For this, allow me to introduce you to Docker Compose, an alternative way of defining containers. So for example, if we'd like to reproduce the same container we ran earlier, we will need a Compose file that defines it. Now, this file is using the YAML language, which is all about indented pairs of keys and values separated by colons. Where the important points are, we are using the TensorFlow notebook image and we are exposing the internal port of our container to the external port of our host system. Now let's quickly save this file as compose.yml. We will then navigate to the folder where we saved it and with a right mouse click, we will open a terminal instance in the current directory. And this time we are dealing with a PowerShell terminal. Now let's quickly make the font larger. And at the moment of filming, I am using Docker Compose version of 2.23.0. Now to run a container with Docker Compose, we will simply type Docker Compose up. Then we will navigate to localhost at port 8000. We will once again copy our token we will paste it back in the notebook and we are back in. But isn't it a bit silly that we always need to copy and paste our tokens? Can't we just set a really nice password instead? Of course we can. So for this, we will go back to our terminal. We will first shut down Jupyter with Control C. Then we will stop and remove our container with Docker Compose down. Then back in our Compose file, we will add another key of environment and we'll assign it to a value of Jupyter underscore token in all caps. Now, in my case, I will set it to I am Batman. Now, let's save it. Let's go back to our terminal and let's call Docker Compose up again. We will then refresh our browser. And now instead of a token, we will specify I am Batman. And beautiful, we are in. Now, the only problem is the notebook that we created earlier is now gone. So before we build a new image, let's make sure we have a way of preserving our files. Now, the way to do so is with something called drive mounting, where we expose a folder from our container to a folder on our host machine, just like we've done with the ports. So back in our compose file, we will create a new key of volumes and we will assign it to a value of dot slash which represents the current directory of our terminal. In my case, that will be this lovely folder where our compose file lives. Then once again, we will separate it with a colon from the directory of our container, which in my case is slash home slash Jovian. Now let's save it. Let's go back to our terminal. Let's shut down our notebook and let's call Docker Compose up again. We will then return to our browser where we see our beautiful compose file in the file tree. Yay! Now the original plan was installing new modules inside a container. So instead of using an existing image, we will build a new one instead. Now the way to build images is with something called docker file, which we will create right away. So the build key is where we specify the location of this file, in our case dot slash, or the same directory as our compose file. Now let's quickly save it, let's create a new file, and let's save it inside our project folder, our lovely mounted drive, and we will save it as docker file with a capital D, no format, no extension, just docker file. Now to make it work, we will need to begin with the from instruction, where from specifies the parent image on which our container is based. In our case, Jupyter slash tensorflow dash notebook. Then right below, we specify our user, which in the case of our tensorflow notebook is a variable named dollar sign and B underscore UID in all caps. And what we really mean here is Jovian, a user with the right permissions. Now, if you are building from a different base image, you will probably have a different username as well. So if you're not sure what it is, please try setting it to root, which is the administrator. So you will basically have unlimited permissions. But since we know our username, we will go ahead and use it instead. Next, we will use the run instruction to pip install dash dash upgrade pip 
and with the help of a double end symbol as well as a backslash we will move to the next line where we will pip install transformers next we will pip install a library called pi srt you will see shortly why and then just as a precaution step we will go ahead and fix dash permissions of a string of slash home slash dollar sign and in a set of curly brackets we will specify nb underscore user and as you may guess once again what we really mean here is jovian and great our docker file is ready we can now save it we can navigate to our terminal and we can call docker compose up again then we will create a new notebook where from transformers we will import pipeline now let's give it a quick run and despite all those warnings transformers was successfully installed how do we know well let's create a new model we'll call it translator we will assign it to pipeline and inside pipeline we will specify a task in our case a string of translation underscore en underscore two underscore fr as in english to french now let's give it a quick run and once the model associated with our translation task was done downloading we can then call translator to which we will pass a very nice sentence in my case my name is maria and i am a programmer let's quickly assign it to fr we will then print it right below and it all comes down to je m'appelle Maria et je suis programmeau. Awesome. But the only problem is we're not really getting a string in return. We are getting a dictionary that is embedded in a list, which is not exactly what we're looking for. So let's quickly focus on the item at index 0 to cancel the list, and then we will focus on the key of translation text to cancel the dictionary. And now when we rerun this cell, everything looks much, much better awesome now let's do something extra useful with our new set of skills so let's take the subtitles from one of my videos specifically in an srt format which is a sequential file with a bunch of timestamps alongside their text and you can find it in the description we will then paste it inside our mounted directory which will load it into our container and then back in our notebook we will first verify that our file was loaded there you go captions english and then we can read it with pi srt dot open to which we will pass the name of the file captions underscore english dot srt we will then assign this expression to subs as in subtitles and we will of course import pi srt before we are using it then we will print the content of our file just to make sure that we loaded it properly with for i in subs we will print i let's give it a run and great there you go everything was properly loaded but because we don't really need to translate the timestamps let's focus on the text only by printing i dot text awesome now let's translate it to French. To do so, we will create an inner loop variable called fr underscore text, and we will assign it to translator, to which we will pass i dot text. Now, since we are looking for a string output, we will once again focus on the item at index zero, as well as the key of translation text then we will simply assign i dot text to our french translation as in fr underscore text then once we are done with our for loop we will go ahead and save our new translation with subs dot save and we will specify the name of our file which in my case would be captions underscore french dot s r t now let's run it and this might take you a minute or two and once jupyter is done we will then navigate to our file tree where we can find our brand new french captions file so let's click it and holy smokes you guys here's our beautiful beautiful translation we did it now the last task is to convert our entire software into an image not just the environment like we've done earlier but also our code that way we can upload it to docker hub and share it with the world now before we do so let's quickly rename our notebook let's call it 
translator. And there's just one tiny detail we will add to our Docker file. We will need a copy instruction that takes files from our project folder and stores them directly on our image. So for example, we will copy captions underscore English dot SRT and we will save it at the root directory of our container, which is dot slash. Now we will do the same for our notebook. We'll just specify it right after our captions with translator dot IPYNB. Great. Now let's save it. Let's navigate back to our terminal where we will first need to stop and remove our current container. Now we can, of course, do it with Docker compose down just like we've done it earlier. But on my end, I'll go ahead and remove all the stopped containers, not just this one with Docker container prune. Yes. And once our container was removed, we can finally go ahead and call Docker Compose up again, which will build our new image. Awesome. We can finally navigate to Docker Hub. We will click on repositories and we will create a new one. Now on my end, I'll call it SRT translator and I'll describe it as English to French SRT video subtitles translator. Let's go ahead and click create and perfect. Now we have a remote repository name. And because it is remote, it means that our terminal is not aware of it yet. So first, let's find the local repository name. And we will do this with Docker images, which will show us all the images that we've pulled and we are currently storing on our system. And then right below repository, we will find the name of our machine learning project. So let's quickly copy it. And now we will need to change it so it perfectly matches the name of our remote repository. To do so, we will type docker image tag followed by the name of the local repository. And since it has the tag of latest, we will add colon latest to the very end of it. Now, right after we specify the new name of the repository, which I'll just copy from my browser. And I will give it the tag of 1.0 because it is the very first version of our image. Now let's run it. And if we check Docker images again, we see a new instance of our image, but this time with the remote repository name. Great, but this repository still lives on our computer. To upload it to Docker Hub, we will type Docker push followed by the new name and the tag of 1.0. Once we hit enter, we finally load our repository to Docker Hub. And once we are done, we will navigate to our browser. We will refresh the page and boom, here's our beautiful, beautiful repository, which is now 100% publicly available. Yay. And let's quickly verify it works as expected. So let's prune our containers once again. Then we will remove the local instance of our image with Docker RMI as in remove image, followed by the name of the image as well as the tag of 1.0. Now we will verify that this image is gone with Docker images and beautiful, it is gone indeed. Now, in addition, I would like to change the current directory of my terminal just to make sure that it has no files in it. I want a completely new folder with nothing inside. To do so, I will type mechdir test as in make a directory named test. We will then navigate there with cd test and now we will go ahead and pull our remote image from Docker Hub with Docker pull followed by the name as well as the tag of 1.0. Now we will run this image and we're not going to use Docker Compose this time. We'll just type Docker run dash P followed by the host system port of let's say 5000. We'll be creative this time followed by the container port of 8888, followed by the name of the image as well as the tag of 1.0. Now let's run it. Let's copy the URL from Jupyter, but we will need to slightly modify it. We will change port 8888 to 5000. And beautiful, 
Here are both of our files, and when we click them, we get the exact same content we had earlier, including the warnings. Now, the best part is, if we navigate to our new test directory, it is absolutely empty. So those files, they never came from our system. They came directly from Docker Hub. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have officially learned how to work with Docker. You can now continue exploring it on your own, so... Congratulations. And thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, please share it with the world. And don't forget to leave it a huge thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos of this kind, you can always subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell. I'll see you very soon in another awesome, simplified tutorial. In the meanwhile, bye-bye.